Greetings. 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 And greetings to our transatlantic and trans-Pacific brothers and sisters who are watching from around the world. We're going to jump straight into worship. I have one announcement to make to keep it at the front of everybody's mind. Just a, a reminder, next week, Dr. Raphael and Momi Ajay are going to be speaking here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, three days in a row. 7 a.m. Friday, Saturday, pardon me, 7 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and at a regular time on Sunday. They'll be emphasizing inner healing from stress and loss and deliverance from personal problems. And they're going to be talking about prophetic destiny on the Sunday. And I'm informed by Ray that Bruce and Cheryl are going to be uh, giving a message the following Sunday on Covenant, I believe. So just keep that at the front of your minds. So with that, that said, we're going to jump right into worship.
We will sing over again. We will bring the highest praise to the King. Sing it again. Sing it again. Your name is glorious. Lift you up higher, higher. Come see what God is done.
Can you will find knock and the door will be answered you have not because you ask not therefore by the blood of the lamb come boldly into the throne room of grace Lay down your hopes and dreams. Give them to the Lord. And he will lift you up in due time. In his time.
over the believers because the beginning of the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we are living in a time where we need to have the wisdom of God, the discernment of the Lord. And we need to do our part. So when things come into your mind and you know they're not of the Lord, take them captive, bring them into obedience to Christ Jesus. That's our role. Take His Word and feed on His Word every day. Every day spend time in the Word of God. Every day pray. And then, <laughs> and then you knock and you wait and see what the Lord is going to do. Because He is faithful and He is true. God is faithful and God is true. So do not conform any longer to the power of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by His Word. And see His will be done, His kingdom come in your life. Lord, you love is unchanging. I'm grateful to God that he's given us skilled worship leaders like Bruce and Cheryl and Marlene. Amen. You too, Marlene. Amen. Amen. So God's essential nature is his holiness and that word holy in Hebrew is kadosh and it carries the meaning of having this complete otherness this this foreignness to anything else that exists there's nothing comparable to it that word often gets abused a lot. I'm sure you guys watched the old uh, Batman from the 60s. You had a Robin. Jumping Jupiter, Batman, or holy smokes, Batman, or whatever. And that word holy just got thrown around a lot. And it's kind of a part of English vocabulary in a very uh, venal and uh, shallow sense. But it's actually got quite the depth of meaning. That's not what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to just share that in passing. So before we begin, I wanted to share a little bit of Bible trivia with you guys. Cheryl perked up, Bible trivia. <laughs> so I'm sure in, you guys are familiar with the, the scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's see if I can get it from memory. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and it's prof profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, so scripture is theonoustos, God-breathed. What's not God-breathed that's in our Bibles is the chapter and verse divisions. Interestingly, in the, in the early 13th century, Archbishop Stephen Langdon and Cardinal Hugo De Sancto Caro developed different systems of reference for the Bible, and it was 
Stephen Langton systems that our modern Bible chapter divisions are based on from Genesis to Revelation, just the chapter divisions. And then later, in 1440 AD, there was a rabbi named Isaac Nathan ben, ben Kaliamas. He created the verse divisions in the Old Testament while he was making a, an English translation of the Hebrew Bible. And he did that based on much older existing sentence structures in the Hebrew. And then later in the 1490s and early 1500s, there was an Italian biblical scholar named Santis Pagino. He became the first person to divide the New Testament into verses, but his system was not really widely accepted. Instead, there was a Parisian printer named Robert Esteen, or as he's more commonly known by his Latin name, Robertus Stephanus. He is the one that made this the system that stuck for the verse division in our New Testaments. And it is useful. It, it is useful. And the very first Bible that used all the chapter divisions from all those past men and all of the, the, the chapter and verse divisions was the, the Geneva Bible in 1560. So, so the chapter and verse divisions that you are familiar with for Bible verse memorization, it's only about, give or take, 500 years old. 600 years old. And it's great for speedily locating a text. It's much easier than saying, okay, God so loved the world, and then okay, oh, God, I just can't look for the, yeah. for the words rather than the numbers. The numbers are much faster, but there's, a, there's a, an inconvenience and a flaw in the system. And that's that they, they, they divide the, the flow of thought oftentimes. So an example in John, the Gospel of John, we were all familiar with um, Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. We're familiar that it starts in John chapter 3, verse 1, but actually it starts in John 2, 23, is when the whole scene takes place, but you don't really pick that up because of the way that's divided in chapters. So there's, there's an example of how it can break up, or even in the text we're going to read today from Hebrews, there's, there's a therefore at the beginning of one chapter, and it completely cuts off the flow of thought from the previous chapter. So if, we're, if you're doing your, your Bible reading plans and it tells you read Hebrews 1 to verse 18 and then pick up verse 19 to chapter 2 and then you can stop right in the middle of a sentence sometimes and it completely disrupts the flow, flow of thought and as a result it can really hinder your ability to uh, intake God's word in a meaningful way because you lose the flow of thought. So something I found really enriching in my own personal life I wanted to share with you is uh, this practice I developed over 10 years. It's not something I just woke up and did. It's something I built up to. But it's reading New Testament epistles in one sitting. Now this doesn't work for the Gospels. It doesn't work for much of the Old Testament. It works for, for some Proverbs and some Psalms and books like Esther and a lot of the, the shorter prophetic books. But for the, for the histories and things like that, it's really hard to do. But for, for Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, pretty much everything from, from Romans all the way to Jude, you could read in one sitting in under an hour. Yeah. And I just, I just wanted to share that, bring this to your attention before we get into it, uh, into Hebrews. Let's go to Colossians 4.16 for a sec. Colossians 4.16. Paul wrote, And when this letter is read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So there's an expectation of them reading the whole thing at once. Or you go to 1 Thessalonians. Just one, one page over. 1 Thessalonians 5.27. Paul said, I implore you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the blood brothers. So there was a, there was an impelling, a, almost a, a direct command to have the entire letter read. And if you go to the very end of the book of Hebrews, which is 13 chapters long, very end, 13, 22, says that he's, 
I've written to you briefly. Briefly. <laughs> so th th there is this expectation that the letters will be read in, 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 in one sitting anyways, which is to be expected because they were addressed to specific groups of people. And you wouldn't, and there was often instructions and personal greetings at the end, so you wouldn't just read half of it one day and then read the other half the next day and then get to the instructions and the personal greetings that may have been urgent at the very end. Now you read the whole thing. So with that in mind, I'm going to do something a little uncouth and read the entire book of Hebrews today, which will only take 40 minutes, surprisingly enough. And it'll interest you to know that Hebrews is actually a sermon. How do I know that? Well, it's not really directed to any particular group by name. It's addressed to the Hebrews, generally speaking. It's thought that this is the, the, the Jewish diaspora, the people that were broken up around Asia Minor that were Jewish but, and followers of Jesus, but they didn't have a, a tribal or national identity per se. It's the diaspora refers to that uh, breaking up and spreading over a large geographical area. So we're going to do that, and there's going to be special emphasis on Hebrews chapter 6 at the end. And I'm going to give some brief teaching on the six elementary teachings of the Christ, Amen. which serve as a foundation upon which to build to understand the heady content that's throughout the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to dive right in and I'm going to read the whole book of Hebrews. For, I, I, just, just a little thought experiment. How many people like watching movies here and there? Can you, can you sit through an hour and a half long movie? Raise your hand. Can you sit through a two-hour movie? Yeah. Can you binge a whole season of a show that's ten episodes long with 45 minute episodes each? Yeah. So if you can do that, you guys can listen to the whole book of Hebrews too. <laughs> I, I got my wife with that one. She when I, when I when I when I told her that I would be reading the, the book of Hebrews today, she said, "People aren't going to pay attention." Well, can you watch a movie if it's three hours long? Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. and you can do that too. Yeah, when I'm when I'm reading whole epistles from start to finish, truthfully, I I often ignore the chapter and verse divisions. I actually have some Bibles that don't have them at all. It's pretty helpful. Just to gauge the entire picture of what's trying to be said. So I'm reading from the LSB. If you guys want to read along with me, you're welcome to it. You can get um, the LSB Bible from your app store. It's free. If you want to read along in your own translation or just listen, that's fine. just encourage you to, to practice active listening and to just notice all the ways that there's comparing and contrasting of how Jesus is more su supreme than angels, more supreme than Moses, more supreme than Melchizedek, more supreme than the Levitical priesthood. All right. The letter of the letter to the Hebrews. God, having spoken long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days spoke to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, who, having accomplished cleansing for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds and his ministers flaming fire. But of the Son, he says, 
Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning founded the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will wear out like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every trespass and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That salvation, first spoken by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according, according to his own will. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testi testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a while little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. In subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that isn't subject to him, is not, that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subject to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will recount your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the seed of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to help those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brothers, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as the builder of the house is more, has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore on my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another, day after day, as long as it is still called, today, 
so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore let us fear, lest, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have fallen short of it. For indeed we have had good news proclaimed to us, just as they also. But the word that was heard did not profit those who were not united with faith amongst those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken somewhere in this way concerning the seventh day. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again determines a certain day. Today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall into the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have an account to give. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. For do we, not, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, being able to deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated, just as for the people, to also offer sacrifices for sins in the same way for himself. And no one takes this honor to himself, but receives it, when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. In this way also, Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest. But he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He, in the days of his flesh, offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. 
Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of teaching about washings, and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permits. For in the case of those once having been enlightened, and having tasted of the heavenly gift, and having been partakers of the Holy Spirit, and having tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles it is unfit and close to being cursed and its end is to be burned. But we are convinced about you, beloved, of things that are better and that belong to salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unrighteous so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and continuing to minister to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not become dull, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promises. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have been taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and confirmed and one which enters within the veil where a forerunner has entered for us, Jesus, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham also apportioned a tenth part of all, was first of all, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest continually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, and those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have a command in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers although these are descendant from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them had collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And in this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And, so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of, the, of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not to be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there also takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not according to a, a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is written about him, you are a priest forever 
according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he was an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much more Jesus also has become the guarantee of a better covenant. And the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which comes after the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now the main point of what's being said is this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the holy places, and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that the high priest also would have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy in it, and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For, see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much he is, a, he is also a mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. But finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will complete a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and upon their hearts I will write them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said, A new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Now even the first covenant had requirements of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle prepared. The first part, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, which is called the holy place. And behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the first part of the tabernacle to perform the divine worship, but into the second only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is indicating this, that the way into the holy places has not yet been manifested while the first part of the tabernacle was still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, Requirements for the body imposed until a time of reformation. 
But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of his creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy places once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the trespasses, that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while one who made it lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by, Mo by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you and in the same way both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry he sprinkled with the blood and according to the law one may almost say all things are cl cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter the holy places made with hands, mere copies of the true ones, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy places year by year with blood that is not his own, Otherwise, he would not have needed to suffer so often since the foundation of the world. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has also manifested, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly wait for him. For the law, since it's only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after, saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. 
Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus and a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully and after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy by the mouth of two or three witnesses. How much more worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has regarded as defiled the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. <clears throat> and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and afflictions, and partly by becoming sharers with those who are so treated. For you also showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted with joy the seizure of your possessions, knowing that you have for yourselves a better and lasting possession. Therefore do not throw away that confidence of yours, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet in a little while. He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, which he was approved as being righteous, God approving his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up <coughs> excuse me, so that he could not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For prior to being taken up, he was approved as being pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who draws near to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah being warned about the things not yet seen, and reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, when he was called, obeying by going out to the place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she had regarded him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, there were born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that as many as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, they have been remembering that country from which they went out, 
they would have had opportunity to return. But now they aspire to a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was offering up his only son, to whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. He considered that God was able to raise people even from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he also received him back. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave commands concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents and because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, regarding the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the rage of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after welcoming the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I recount Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, as well as David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, performed righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong from weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection." And others experienced mockings and floggings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom this world was not worthy, wandering in desolate places and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, lay aside every weight and the sin which also easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary, fainting in heart. For you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are being reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he flogs every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. And what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children, not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our benefits, that we may share his holiness. And all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. But to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord, saying to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble. 
and by it many be defiled. And also there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear what was being commanded. If even a beast touches that mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was what appeared that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the festal gathering and assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this expression, yet once more, indicates the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let love of the brothers continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you yourselves also are in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for the sexually immoral and adulterers God will judge. Make sure that your way of life is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no authority to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go to him outside the, gate, the camp bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the one to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they will do this with joy and not with groaning, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves well in all things, and I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, our Lord Jesus, equip you in every good thing to do his will by doing in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ.
to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. But I urge you, brothers, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes, I will see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. That wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> Turn to Hebrews 6. Now all those technicalities that the author of Hebrews was diving into are rich rich with insight. Very, very, very fruitful for studying. And I would encourage everyone here, if you have ambition in the Lord, to read this to yourself sometime. I would encourage you to do it out loud. It's easier to keep concentration. But look up the references that are made. There's hundreds of references to the Old Testament. Read them in their own context. Some of it will just seem a little bit weird, not a place because the author of Hebrews was actually quoting from the Greek Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. In our Bibles, most, most modern English Bibles are taken, uh, the, 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 the words that you have in English are coming from the Masoretic text, which was a, an old Hebrew manuscript. So there's a few discrepancies, but the, the contents is the same. So if, you, so if you see something kind of a little weird, doesn't quite match up, that's why. So focusing in here on... Hebrews 6, I'll just repeat a short line here. See, this this is going back to those pesky chapter and verse divisions again. Um, Hebrews 5, 11, I'll start there and go into uh, 6, 3. So at 5, 11, Concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, the Anointed One, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of, one, repentance from dead works, two, and a faith toward God, Three, teachings about washings. Four, laying on of hands. And five, the resurrection of the dead. And six, eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now, you see this in passing, but what he's saying here is, is that's the foundation upon which you need to build in order to understand the heady, rich, theological richness that he elucidates later. So I suggest, if one doesn't have a solid grasp of those six foundational teachings, you have a shaky ground on which to build to gain deeper insight into the Lord, His Spirit, and to uh, His revealed Word that we have so graciously given to us. So I want to just unpack these briefly. I'm not going to go into too much depth for the sake of time. But repentance from dead works. Uh, I, there's a misconception, of, uh, I know it's been taught historically by, by some, that the, the, the dead works refers to, to Judaism, the laws of Moses, the law of God. And if you recall what I, what I taught about uh, God's law some months ago, and Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, this, this cannot be. It cannot be that the author is saying that if you do what God commands you to do, repent from that. No. Dead works is another way of saying sin. I emphasize on the deadness. We are dead in our sins. And just like Paul said the, in, in Romans, the wages of sin is death. We, we are completely dead in, our, in ourselves. And we need to be revived, vivified, revivified, enlivened, resurrected, brought to new life. So repentance from dead works, it means, and I, I think Ralph has said this over and over again, I've said it over and over again, repentance, metanoia in Greek, that's the word being used here. It means to, to turn around, to go another direction, to walk towards God, to have a change of mind, it's even implied. It has to do with your thinking. 
And you need to agree with God and you need to walk toward God. And you need to repent from the deadness of sin. So that's that's milk. Not solid food, that's milk. Faith toward God. Remember in James, he says that even the demons believe and shudder. So there's a distinction then, biblically, between belief in God and faith in God. And what I really appreciate about this book is that there's a, and I, this is really important for us to do, we've got to, we got to uh, define biblical words with the Bible as our dictionary. So in, in Hebrews 11, we get the definition of what faith is. In Hebrews 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now that word conviction can also be translated equally properly, evidence. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or evidence of things not seen. So there's evidence of things around us that aren't seen that point back to God, that his promises are true. And another word that I like to use as a substitute for faith is trust, because I think it communicates the more gravity of what the author here is trying to communicate. It's, it's trusting that what God says is going to come to pass, in other words. So faith ain't, ain't what you... Faith isn't believing what you know ain't so... Okay. Faith isn't a leap. Faith is not blind. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not for the weak. Faith is not make-believe. It's, it's a state of the heart. It's a gift of God. And it's trusting that God is who he says he is that he's faithful, that he's good, that he's righteous, that he's holy, and that what he says, he will do. Full stop. Exclamation mark. No ifs, ands, or buts. So faith toward God, different than belief in God. You can believe God exists. Not good enough. You have to trust him. You have to have faith in him. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or evidence of things not seen. That's milk. And teaching about washings. Now, that word washings is baptismal in the Greek, which from which we get the word baptism. And some translations uh, translate that word washing, baptismal, as baptism. I appreciate what the English Standard Version and the the Legacy Standard Bible that I've read from today, what, what, those tra- what that translation team did. They chose to use the word washing because it makes a distinction from the theologically dense term baptism. So, So here... Teaching about washings isn't methodological about how you do the baptism. Baptism does mean immersion. I don't think it's arguable at all that you can uh, say it's that it's not. You know, there's, a, there's an old joke I've heard some people say: "Oh, people have been killed and wars have been fought over sprinkling, dipping, or dunking." <laughs> Sad but true. But what this seems to actually be pointing to is instructing a believer before they're baptized in the name of the Lord and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's, a, there's an ancient work that was discovered at the end of the 1800s called The Instruction of the Master Through His Twelve Apostles. It's for short, it's called the Didache. Uh, instruction. Didache is Greek for instruction. And it's a short little book. If you guys want to see, I brought it with me. I brought it with me. Um, I actually read it, read the whole thing yesterday. It's not very long. And it essentially summarizes the Sermon on the Mount, loving your enemies as yourself, denying the pleasures of the flesh, uh, faith toward God, repentance from your sins, being dependent on Jesus, living in Jesus, being generous, all these things we're familiar with from reading the Gospels and Jesus' teaching. It just summarizes it really condensely, and then it, and then it gives a small little blurb about baptizing. So what this seems to suggest is doing discipleship one-on-one or, or um, the elementary teaching one-on-one with the person that's about to be baptized. Preparing them for it, not making them ignorant of it, and making them recognize the significance that they're being buried with Christ as they're going under the water and they're rising with him as they're coming out of the water 
and they're being made a new creation. And there's also a picture, uh, Peter mentions this too, he, he refers, he, he says, and baptism which also saves you, and he's talking about Noah and the eight that were saved in the flood of Noah, and some people wrongfully say that, oh, baptism is the thing that, that saves you. Wrong, it's Jesus that saves you. What, what he's saying is, is that the water is what drowned the enemies of Noah and God in the water, and he's preserved his people. So there's this, also this picture in the baptism that the wrath of God is drowning his enemies, and you're being preserved, and you're floating up out of it like the ark. Amen. Letting someone know the significance of all that. Not just, try Jesus and see if you like him. and Just come to Jesus, all you need is Jesus, and come be baptized. That, yes, amen, that's true. But, no, you need to be immersed in Christ. You need to know the deeper stuff, because what you win them with is what you win them to. So if you win them with shallowness, they're going to breathe shallowness. You need to give depth. They need to wreak depth. Amen. What you win them with is what you win them to. So the laying on of hands. I've observed in my short life many uh, misappropriations of this in brothers, groups of brothers and sisters that affirm rightfully the gifts of the Spirit. And I've been personally affected by ignoring the teaching of Paul in 1 Timothy. He uh, so, so, so the laying on of hands, we know from the, from the Old Testament, that, and specifically in the Torah, that priests would lay their hands on the goat to identify it as a sacrifice for the Lord, and then they'd take the goat's life, spread the blood, and then they'd sprinkle it on the altar. There's allusions to that in what we read. And then Moses put his hands on Joshua to confer leadership to him. So it's a marker of identity and conferring of, of leadership. There's also what Paul says to Timothy about... Uh, him receiving a prophetic word through the laying on of hands, and there's some kind of a conferring of a prophetic destiny through the laying on of hands. And then, excuse me, one chapter later, in the same letter, 1 Timothy chapter 5, I believe, he's talking about don't be hasty, don't be quick for the, to, to, to lay on hands, for by so, so doing, some have partaken in the sins of others. And I've partaken in the sins of others. I learned the hard way. For good reason, glory to God for it. I don't bellyache or grumble about it. Valuable lessons. But um, an an elementary teaching about the Christ is being careful to lay on hands, and particularly when it comes to the identifying and uh, ordination and conferring of anointing with leadership. Don't be quick. Mm -hmm. Don't be quick. Heed Paul's warning. Don't make my mistake. Be slow, thoughtful, and pray for extra discernment in the spirit, which is a spiritual gift. So that's milk. The resurrection of the dead. There's a lot of controversy around this subject. There was in Jesus' day, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as we we, we usually just, in our, in our, uh, our minds, we usually just relegate that to the, to the drawer of hypocrites when we think about them, but they, they, those names refer to theological schools of thought. And they believe very specific things. Jesus, interestingly enough, belonged to the Pharisaical school of thought. He just had problems with, with their application, not so much their theology, which is why he accosted them and, and confronted them and rebuked them in public. The Sadducees, they didn't believe that Angels, demons, or the resurrection, or the spirit world existed. They denied it, and they only believed that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy was the word of God. Everything else was meh. Which is why Paul got got, got them all riled up in in Acts when he was being put up to trial by Festus, and he talked about the resurrection of the dead, and then Sadducees tore their clothes. How dare you talk about the resurrection of the dead? (laughs) That was pretty sensitive for them. Even today, there's... You hear a lot of people say, oh, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. That's where you're going to be. But what about the heavens and the new earth? We're given new bodies. The resurrection of the dead is an actual, literal thing. It's not metaphorical. You, Bruce, you, Cheryl, you, Shelley, you, Jill, and you, Ralph, and me, Brock, we're all going to get new 
physical, tangible, fleshy stuff without corruption someday. And we're going to be in the company of others just like that. Like Christ. Amen. And I'm reminded of uh, the end of First Thessalonians. I'll just go there quick. Because I think it's relevant. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest of us who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive will remain until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I think it's important for leaders to admit their biases and their views to the people that they're teaching to, so I'm just going to admit that and if this isn't picking a bone or attacking anybody. I'm just saying I reject a pre-tribulational rapture. I believe that that passage is not referring to that. I, refer, I, I believe it's referring to the actual resurrection event, the giving of God to his people new bodies. So I just want to tell you where I stand on that. I'm not here to dispute that. I just thought it's, it's important to admit that so that there's no confusion. Like we, we can talk about that another time. And there's, there, there, there's room for um, disagreement on that, and we can do that in a respectful, godly, loving way. So back, back to, to, Hebrew, to Hebrew 6. So the resurrection of the dead, it's going to happen for the, the just and the unjust. It's going to happen to believers and unbelievers, some unto everlasting glory and some to everlasting condemnation, we're told. So scripture presents it as a literal event, not, not a metaphor. So that's, that's milk. And lastly, eternal judgment. So there's going to be a day that God the Father is fixed Somewhere in the future where he will judge his people and he will judge his enemies. We sing it often, and I'm thankful that we do. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne, and he will judge justly. And I have a suspicion, I, I can't speak with this with, with authority, but I have a suspicion based on Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 about hypocritical judgment, that judge not lest you be judged for the one who judges will be judged with the measure he uses. People often use that or cite that to deflect any judgment at all, but what he's teaching against is hypocritical judgment. Don't be a hypocrite when you judge. It's okay to judge. To judge is to say what's right and what's wrong, but use the same weights and measures. Be consistent. So why do I bring that up? I think on that great day of judgment, God's going to use men and women who don't know him, their own standards against them. How scary that would be. Yeah. That would be just. That would be repaying someone according to their works. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So there's a fixed day of, of eternal judgment. So we, we, we can have hope. I want to encourage you with this. We can have hope that if something atrocious, painful, and excruciating happens to us or someone we love, and there's not judgment or justice served in this life, there will be in the next. There are so many who protest in the United States and in Canada for various causes who don't have that understanding. They think that justice is in this life only and can sometimes overlook true justice and the principles of it to try and exact a punishment on someone not knowing that there will be a perfect and righteous punishment exacted on those who are the true guilty party on that day of judgment and we can rejoice rightfully without shame or embarrassment at that because our God is holy, true and a perfect judge and he doesn't get bribed, he doesn't get corrupted he doesn't get swayed by lobby groups 
doesn't get swayed by political interests. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever as we are, as I've just read today. So if we want to comprehend the more significant, deep teaching of the scripture and actually build on a firm foundation, I would encourage you all to revisit these foundations. And if there's any cracks in it that the Lord has brought to your attention, then focus on those cracks and with the Spirit, repair them. Do the, do the work that's necessary to re, do the repair in your foundations and use this, this scripture as the guide. And I would also suggest this is a great framework to keep in your mind when talking to new believers or people that you win to Christ. It's a, it's a bulletproof, excellent foundation that's biblical to give people an overview of the basics, but then you can build on that. So as we were exhorted in the, the very end of Hebrews to give a sacrifice of praise, I invite Bruce and Cheryl to lead us in one more song. And then after that one song, I'd like us to partake of the Lord's Supper together, and then we can enjoy a meal in each other's fellowship. Thanks, Brock. Uh, it's very interesting because we had five worship songs lined up, and I didn't feel like the last one was was right, and just left it um, without going into the fifth one. And, and you're asking us to to go forward again, and um, it is right now. <laughs> so I know here we usually don't do a don't do a song at the end, but um, very fitting that you would ask, and uh, this one is it as well, as well as my soul. Amen. And everything that you spoke to points to um, our life with Christ Amen. and his sanctification of us and, uh, and our partnership with him, and it is well with our soul when we do walk with him, and, um, and we abide in, in him and in his love. Amen.
waves and waves still know me his name for this day, Lord. This is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we delight in it, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord, that was delivered uh, from your servant rock, God, that uh, has pierced our hearts, Lord. Lord, we love you. We love your word, Lord. Uh, we love your servants, God, that you send to us, God. So rich in the world, Lord. So rich in your word, Lord, and so faithful, Lord, to your commandments, God. And so, Lord, we thank you, God, and we bless you, we praise you, we love you, and we adore you, Lord, and uh, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon everyone who has joined us today, Lord, those who are far and near, Lord, um, those who couldn't be with us in this house, but, Lord, are celebrating you in, in their house as well, God. We thank you for them, Lord, um, and we thank you for your presence in this place. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you, Bruce and Cheryl. To our brothers and sisters across the Atlantic and across the Pacific in the majority world, we say greetings and now farewell from Carberry. Thank you for tuning in, for your attention. And we say to you, as to everybody here, the Lord bless you and keep you and keep his face upon you. May he fill you with strength, vigor, life, and joy in Jesus. Grace to you all.